Who was that? John Major. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, so none of those mentioned the word well-being, but uh, that of course was the first one who gets into the well-being as, as Richard mentioned. Uh, and this was conversations that I had with David Cameron pre-becoming Prime Minister when you actually sit down with, as Cabinet Secretary with the person who is leader of the opposition in that what you're going to do when you come in. And he was very clear about getting the point about it's not about GDP. <coughs> and of course the emphasis I've always said is, I mean, it, this sort of audience is sophisticated enough to know it's not about GDP. So I don't need to labour that point, but in lots and lots of other areas you do have to labour this point. They think it's all about incomes. And David Cameron wasn't there. You know, when we think about this man's legacy, curiously enough, there may be a few negatives now about his legacy. <laughs> but this, and starting the measurement, because for me, all of the analysis you're going to do, all you wonderful people in this room, can use now data that we've been collecting now for a number of years in uh, quite disaggregated form about the classic four ONS questions on well-being. And uh, that can give us really interesting insights and start to build up that data. All of the things that we're talking about, those life cohort stuff and all the rest of it, I think the unsung heroes of social science should be whoever it was that started collecting the data and keeping it in a consistent form. The number of times I've had to say, no, you can't change that question. Right? I know it's not quite right. But if you change that question, then we've got a horrible problem to do the analysis. Um, so that's quite good. And again, you get the problem that everyone says, when you start talking to the Treasury about this, they say, oh, no, it's all woolly sociology stuff. Ugh. So the ultimate purpose of economics is, of course, to understand and promote the enhancement of well-being. Who said that? Ben Bernanke, not known for his wooliness, right? No. Head of the Fed, uh, proper economic historian as well as proper economist powerful on policy. So I think those are the things that really matter. And the kinds of people you have to convince are the not just the, the policy people, not just the ministers, but the technical economists and the standard policy analyses when you're thinking about how do we put this into policy. So those things were really important. This is the wrong chart, right? This should be a chart. Uh, this is a kind of bizarre chart I was looking at, which was what if for the vote leave stuff, vote versus vote remain, people were saying about, talking about old age, if you actually weighted people about how many years life they've got left, would you change the result? And the answer is no. And that's because there are so many old people, right? Uh, they just dominate. There are so many, I have to say us now, a this lot. It's horrible. Um, so, the chart that would have been there, just imagine, is an interesting chart that was, that was done by um, uh, an EF, uh, New Economics Foundation, relating, uh, this is important, the percentage vote leave across areas to, uh, now they looked at the relationship between <coughs> income, income inequality, levels of well-being, none of those things work. What, ma what does have a strong correlation is the distribution of well-being in every area. So those areas where inequality is high in well-being, vote leave, uh, other things being equal. Obviously that's work in progress and I'm sure people will analyze that in a lot more detail. That's an interesting example of using that micro data to say, okay, we all, I think, in this room would like to understand precisely why we got that vote uh, and precisely what it is that policy should be geared at. And I think there's you know, two things the government has to do now, and I keep telling people this because they, they really only focus on One is, so how, if Brexit is Brexit, how do we leave Brexit in the best possible way, which Tim uh, was talking about, and a lot of us will be working on for the next N years, where N is probably gonna be very large. And the second thing, of course, is we have a new government. I think people are forgetting this. We have a new prime minister, a new government, who could actually, start to say, explain to me what happened in that vote, explain to me what are the issues. And I think if I were a political advisor, which obviously I'm not as a cross-bencher, I'm interested in politics, obviously, I'd be saying, if you're a conservative, you're thinking about all of these people, particularly outside the urban areas, the shires, those traditional labor areas where a lot of votes went UKIP, how do you get them to a conservative but if you understand the reasons why people were voting the way they were, it might lead you to the right sets of policies 
uh, to get there. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about that today. Better policy measures. First of all, um, we need clear success measures. So, so let me give you the example of the session you've just been through. Right? Really interesting analysis of older people, and there was a set of uh, issues. Loneliness is really important. Eyesight is really important. Mobility, those sorts of things. So how would you go about translating that into real policy? Well, the answer, of course, is as with everything to do with well-being and policy, I'll shamelessly, of course, the new book will be fine, but the one that uh, I did with Richard Loud, Angus Deaton, uh, David Halpern, uh, and Martin Duran has all the answers in it already uh, <laughs> as to how you solve these issues. And interestingly, in chapter five, we gave some examples, but if you're interested in the philosophical bits, uh, uh, they're there at the start, and I strongly recommend you look at them. The examples we gave in, in the policy bits were one of the key ones that David Halpern was talking about was loneliness, and how do we solve loneliness? How you translate uh, that chart, the sorts of charts that you had up there about uh, people there, into a real policy conclusion is we need a translation device. Now, a translation device could either be um, because we are so used to money and GDP, we translate those changes in life satisfaction into units of money, uh, uh, and then you can compare them with other policies, right? Uh, and that, that gives you a way. Or we can convert other things, or we can just leave money out. For example, uh, you're in charge of a health service, or let's, let's have this wonderful world, we've got health and social care, all in one nice bucket. And you can spend your money either on a few more doctors to do some more cataract surgery, um, or you can spend your money on social services to improve loneliness. Uh, and there's all sorts of interesting things you could do about the design of public services to make them more, uh, to make them improve well-being more. One classic example, so when we did pension credit, we moved to pension credit, um, cumbersome process, person to person, you go in office, you fill in some forms, oh my God, really expensive. The wizzo people come in and say, let's do it all on the phone, because you know it's gonna be a lot cheaper, a lot better, and you put it on the phone, fantastic, you can do it a lot more quickly and all the rest of it, and you start getting the McKinsey's in, and ah, oh, how wonderful McKinsey's are. McKinsey's will tell you, we can improve this because your phone call is taking far too long. They get you through that phone call really quickly and in two minutes you have sorted out pension credit. Person at the other end of the phone, and you start talking to people saying, what about this? They say, well, it's not really working for me. People who are doing the phones, why? They want to talk to me about their grandchildren. Grandchildren <laughs> come up. They want to tell me about their lives. Actually, that interaction, which thought pension credit was just about money, is wrong. Pension credit was as much about interaction. Uh, my wife is a volunteer with uh, Citizens Advice Bureau. Quite a lot of the people that come into Citizens Advice Bureau, it's partly about an issue to do with debt or whatever, but it's also partly about social interaction. And actually, when you think about designing public services, actually, what you'll get from the McKinsey's of this world quite often is a very narrow bit about we've digitized this, we put it all online, it's fantastic, it's open 24 seven. Now there are great advantages to that, don't get me wrong, because that could save you money you could use elsewhere. Great things about online is you remove prejudice, they don't care uh, what color you are. So there are lots of really good things about that, but sometimes you lose the personal interaction, and when you're not measuring the well-being aspect of that, you lose out. So if you want to do a proper analysis and, and the kinds of things that will come out of this book, loneliness, cataracts, mobility, how do we do those trade-offs? Then you need to do what we would call in the trade social cost-benefit analysis, which sorts out those sorts of things. So, uh, and your clear success measure would be improving well-being, right? Absolutely, what David Cameron said there. And uh, the question that was put is, is that gonna help politicians? Uh, um, Richard Rowe in LSE, they did some really interesting work about the relationship between incumbents getting re-elected and what has happened to well-being. And the interesting answer is rather asymmetric. We had someone talking about loss aversion and all the rest of it earlier. There is an asymmetry there. When well-being goes up, people think it's all down to their brilliance. 
And when well-being goes down, it's the government's fault. Right? I'm kind of used to that. So there is an asymmetry there. But if you if overall well-being levels have gone down, it's really hard for incumbents to get re-elected or harder, other things being equal. Um, appropriate behavioral assumptions, I think, are really, really important when you're talking about the well-being stuff. You do need to understand loss aversion. You do need to understand how people behave. And when you're doing these responses and you're thinking about things which will enhance well-being, you also need to think about how uh, people behave. So when you're thinking, we, we talked about old age, right? And we talked about, uh, actually that was about wealth. But income, I think, does matter, particularly at low levels, uh, we find. So uh, why are pensioners uh, unhappy in their old age? One reason being low levels of income. Why have they got low levels of income? Because they didn't save enough, right? Why didn't they save enough? Because they didn't think about pensions in the right way. Uh, maybe it was uh, myopia, uh, those whole you know, time inconsistency issues, all the rest of it. Actually, how do you solve that? Uh, how do you improve the well-being? And if you're doing a well-being analysis, well, actually, we stumbled upon part, of, and I think stumbled is probably the right word. I wish I could say it was really worked out. Stumbled upon a, a behavior change which made a huge difference, which was just to simply change the default on pensions. So auto-enrollment, so you're in a pension to start with, and you have to actively do something to change that, has meant that savings levels have gone up dramatically. Now, when people say to you, uh, well, you know, that's just a change. Uh, I, mean, I mean, what's it worth? If, and, and I've, I have asked this question of DWP, and I, I will give you the answer. I'm not sure I completely believe it. Um, when I was in Treasury, actually, when I was working for John Major, we started something called Tessas, which were one of the first uh, vehicles for trying to improve people's savings by giving you a tax break, ISAs, as you now think of them, right? Um, and when we've looked at the impact of changing those tax reliefs on the amount you save, uh, there's, a, there's an interesting article in Denmark which basically says for every pound uh, you get an extra penny of savings, right? Auto enrolment changed the level of pensions so much. How much do you think you'd have to do in tax breaks? What would it be worth? And the DWP answer I got, which I'm not quite sure I quite believe, was one trillion pounds. Right? <laughs> Now, I'm not sure I believe that, but all I'm saying is sometimes these things can be enormously powerful, right? And when people say you haven't got the money for these things, actually, we do waste an enormous amount of money on things which could be made available, which would have more direct impacts on well-being. Now, uh, what other things do we need to do? Uh, the example you've seen, mental health was picked up for old age. Actually, it turns out it's really, really important virtually every age group, uh, as, as uh, Richard has pointed out in lots of ways. Schools, I think, if you do start talking about, we spend an enormous amount of money and teachers time on measuring exam results in schools. Um, Richard and I were having a conversation with Nikki Morgan, who was starting to say, actually, I understand what you're getting at in terms of well-being, and she's gone. So we're going to have to start <laughs> all over again. But the point being, Imagine if, if those league tables, instead of being league tables of A to C's and all those fit, were actually league tables in terms of the average well-being, subjective well-being of the kids. Now it turns out yeah. that there's not a problem here. If, if their subjective well-being goes up, their exam results go up as well. And in fact, their subjective well-being is probably a better indicator of their future incomes than their exam results, as again, some, some cohort work has shown. So these sorts of things are very important. Macro policy. Um, if you think again about loss aversion, you know, Gordon Brown's famous, no more boom or bust. Actually, when you think about it, wouldn't it be better if we had a relatively steady pattern of economic growth? We didn't go through those boom and bust periods. So we trade off a little bit of average growth for a much lower deviation. So we didn't go through these recessions because the impact of unemployment can be so devastating on well-being. It would start to have an impact on the way you run Macro policy. I've talked about pensions policy and I won't go into devolution because it's just too complicated to do now. <laughs> when you think about um, the whole set of, of uh, areas, you know, you've got policies and you go through all of these different areas. And I think the point that was made by one of the questioners, a very good point, 
about the interactions between these things. I think the way we need to model these things is not seeing